Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Looks like we made it. Um... Talks amongst yourselves, greet your neighbors. We're right back. <laughs> so this is the big old Paul Tillich talk. Um, we're gonna do two weeks of Tillich um, because there's a lot to unpack here. I'm not sure if you all got a chance to, sorry, I'm just cleaning my glasses. If you got a chance to um, check out the uh, the talk or the yeah read the talk. It's pretty good. Hopefully, I have the right copies here in front of me. Well, let's let me tell you a little bit about Paul Tillich in case you don't know and you're curious. Um, so let's see. I've got as you can see, I've got the. Paul Tillich book here, which is this talk it's from, is The Shaking of the Foundations. And um, he's, I mean, this book's been released a ton. They, there's this copy here, another little copy. Um, the one I'm reading from today, which is later printing. Um, and he's got three books of his collections of his sermons about this size. Um, one is called The New Being, and the other one is The Internal Now. And it's just a, coll a collection of his talks. And it's a really great place to start with Tillich because um, Tillich is, is very hard to read. Um, his talks aren't, but his theology and philosophy books are very tough to read. And I have a lot of them. Um, he uh, was very, probably one of the most important theologians in the 20th century philosopher, theologian, he, uh, he, um, he, he was very influential on people like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, different people like that, but here is uh, Paul Tillich on the cover of Time magazine. Um, this was in 1955, was it, was, this, was it 55? Now, this is 19, this one says March 16th, 1959 is when this was. was. Um, so, yeah, there's that. And uh, this is when it, you know, was made something when you were on time, the cover of Time magazine. Um, a theology for Protestants, because I guess people didn't think Protestants had theology at that point. Um... His probably his most famous work is, I think I have a copy back here somewhere. There's one of his books. No, I've got a lot of his books back here, but I was trying to find it. It's probably, where is it? Let's see if it's up here. Um... The Courage to Be, that's probably his most popular book, which is that, it's just this here is The Courage to Be is probably Paul Tillich's most pop popular book. Um, everybody was reading it, and everybody was really smart in the 50s. Um, <laughs> this is from um, a time collection of, uh, I don't know what they did, they sent these out, these little things, Time Magazine did back in the day of just people who had graced their covers and a photograph of them giving, it's like a collecting card or something, but for, for Time Magazine, uh, they released in 83. Um, the professor of theology was the first non-Jewish professor dismissed from the university by the Nazis when they came to power. When did this happen? 1933. There's questions that we can play games with each other. Um, <laughs> what else does it say? This theologian came to New York from Germany to teach at what institution that trains people for Christian ministry? Union Theological Seminary, which is really cool because I got a chance to speak a couple times at Union Theological Seminary 
and uh, he taught there. Now, another thing that's very interesting about Paul Tillich is he had to, not only was he kicked out of Germany by Hitler, but when he moved to America, he didn't speak English. So he became a professor and had to learn English right away. And uh, a lot of his early earlier talks were really tough to, for him to give, but in some ways it, he had to kind of simplify his work for a lot of people in the beginning uh, because given his new, new language. And uh, it was pretty interesting because he's such a highly intellectual, intense human being. What is the name of his three volume work? Oh, that's probably the other most popular one if you're a student, is The Systematic Theology, Volume 1, 2, and 3. I have only read Volume 1, and it's so dense. I don't know if, how much I could tell you about, but I took a class on, um, on, system, on Systematics Theology, Volume 1, and uh, I think that was the only way I could get through it, knowing that I could talk with it, talk through it with other people, but yeah. So, 20th century theologian, German, kicked out of Germany by Hitler. Um, yeah, he's quite a life. I've, I've read a lot about his life. He also wrote a book on architecture. Um, great thinker. And uh, so that's, that's who, 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 who wrote this, this talk today. I believe this talk was originally given at Union Seminary to the students um, in chapel, I think is where this was originally given. Um, so let me tell you, my, the first time I had any uh, connection to Paul Tillich was uh, reading a Brennan Manning book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. And he quotes a small part of, I believe it was The Ragamuffin Gospel, of this Tillich sermon. And I thought, oh, that sounds really incredible. And I found it online one day. And then um, when I met Peter Rollins, oh God, 11, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, he was trying to introduce me to some philosophers. Pardon me. Time change, right? And, and Paul Tillich was one of the people who said, oh, you should check out Tillich. And um, so I started reading Tillich and, and some other people. But yeah. That was the beginning of an adventure for me. Um, but this, this sermon that he gave was so powerful to me that um, I ended, I believe it was my last book. I, I um, was it my last book? No, it was my, um, no, it wasn't my last book. It was Faith and Doubt. Um, was it, was it the last? No, it was Fall to Grace. It was Fall to Grace. And in, in, in the end of Fall to Grace, I put a, a section of that this talk also in in the end of at, towards the end of my book. I ended my book with it. And when it came out on paperback, I felt like, you know, I think I should put the whole talk in there. The whole his whole talk. <laughs> So I went to the book company and I said, listen, I know you guys are doing a paperback for this one. I said, so could you, could we put the whole book, the whole, the whole, not the whole book, but the whole sermon at the end of my thing. And I think we compromised and did like 70% of the sermon or something, but um, still got more of it put in there. And uh, I was really excited to have that part of, part of my book. Um, so I've, I one time years ago read this, I recorded it, but I don't know what happened to the recording of the talk. Uh, I just just re recorded the, his talk. I just read it. And um, I was thinking maybe we should hire somebody to read it and have it just as a, a standalone thing to look at. So hopefully you, you, you got a chance to read it. If you haven't, this is Paul Tillich's You Are Accepted. And we're going to go through it like we would just go through anything, like any letter from the Bible. Um, so let's let's hit it up. Shall we? Oh, thank you, Bob. Um, and so this this starts out uh, as a lot of talks is, is just kind of a um, a look at at a, he starts with Romans five twenty. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might be abound, but where sin abounds, grace did abound more 
grace did much more abound. So where sin abounds, grace abounds more. And, uh, yeah. And so he's like, let's talk about this. And so here is Paul Tillich talking about Romans 5. These words of Paul summarize his apostolic experience, his religious message as a whole, and the Christian understanding of life. To discuss these words or to make them the text of even several sermons has always seemed impossible to me. I've never dared to use them before, but something has driven me to consider them during the past few months. A desire to give witness to the two facts which appeared to me in hours of retros retrospection as all determining facts of our lives. The, abound, the abounding of sin and the great abounding of grace. There are few words more strange to most of us than sin and grace. They are strange just because they are so well known. And I was thinking about how interesting that is. Is I mean, this is, what, 1950-something. I can't remember exactly. I don't, one of my books, I think, actually has the years uh, that these... I think this book was actually written in 48, 1948. So these, you know, we're talking a long time ago. Um, you know, 70 some odd years ago. But even then, the idea of like these words, like they're so strange to us, but he's saying they're strange just because they're so no, so well known. You know, and, and we've kind of, the, this, there's been a distortion and mechanization of these kind of ideas of like, what is sin? You know, and people are like, sin is missing the mark. And what is grace? Unmerited favor. You know, and then we just, okay, let's go on. And those are, you know, and we don't focus on those or, you know, and then you look at like grace in, in different denominations and just different Christian denominations, what it means to people and then people outside of the church, what grace means. You know, so you've got these words, and also the word sin. I mean, it's a weird word, and a lot of people aren't comfortable with it, and, you know, it's like, what does it mean? And so, you know, here you have one of the greatest minds of the 20th century saying, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what these words mean to us, and why should we take them seriously, and why are they important? Um, during the century, they have received distorting connotations and have lost so much of their genuine power that we must seriously ask ourselves whether we should use them at all or whether we should discard them as useless tools. But there is a mysterious fact about the great words of our religion's tradition. They cannot be replaced. All attempts to make substitutions, including those I have tried myself, have failed to convey the reality that was to be expressed. They have led to shallow and impotent talk. There are no substitutes for word like sins, like word for sin and grace. But there is a way to rediscovering the meaning of the same way that leads us down into the depths of our human existence. In the depths, these words were conceived, and there they gained power of for all ages. There they must be found again by each generation. And each of us, for himself, let us therefore try to penetrate the deeper level of our life in order to see whether we can discover in them the realities of which our text speaks. And I love the depth in the passion which, which Tillich talks about grace here. You know, he's saying each generation must find it on their own and find it in their depths and find it, you know, and it really is this kind of thing of like, how do we live in grace? How do we accept grace? How do we give grace? And how do we see what is sin? And why? And, and is sin something that we've just made up? Is it just some sort of fairy tale thing? Is it about the fall? You know, what is it? And, and Tillich's going to get into that more. But I love this passionate thing of he's saying these are words that are so potent and mean to something, but every, it's something for all humans to wrestle with. You know, all people to 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 work through and find meaning in these words from within them, that it's, it's vitally important. And, and I keep saying all people, you know, all humans, you know, the reason I'm, I keep saying that is because we talk a lot about diversity. Um, but, you know, I, I say here, like, I got this ring, it says uh, grace on it. And the A's got a little anarchy symbol. 
Um, because I always say grace is anarchy because it doesn't work within our own systems. It works outside of system. You know, everybody wants to put an asterisk by grace. And I would say even some want to put an asterisk by sin. And uh, what do those look like? And this is going to, really this first week, we're going to do this week and next week. This first week is just really just kind of more about like what it means by sin and this type of thing. But it, I think it's going to hit us hard and well because I think taking someone who's knows their theology, knows the language, the biblical language, knows the text of the Bible, putting this into a truer perspective and not putting on, you know, a hundred years of evangelicalism or hundreds of years of just Christianity in America, um, you know, is, is kind of a beautiful thing. Um, have the men of our times... There's also, if you have, uh, I was going to say this too, is it, it, this is a pronoun city right here. This is male pronoun city here. So that's how it was written. So I'm going to read it how it was written. Um, have the men of our time still a feeling of the meaning of sin? Do they or do they and do we still realize that sin does not mean immoral act? Now, did you hear that? I'm going to say that one over again in a very preacher style. Um, do they or do we realize that sin does not mean an immoral act? That sin should never be used in the plural. And that not our sins, but rather our sin is the great all-pervading problem of our life. Now, what I would have given to have this this someone to talk to me about this or say this to me um, 27 years ago when I was just miserable, you know, uh, growing up and, you know, I thought it was about sin management. And to be honest with you, after, even after I realized what grace was, I still probably spent 10 more years still thinking like, uh, still about sin management, you know, like, mm, grace, you know, asterisk, <laughs> you know, still got to... <laughs> I'm still going to be good. So I got to make sure everything's right. You know, and what I didn't realize is that, that it was kind of that cart before the horse thing and that really grace is the first thing to come in our lives. And uh, it's, it's a transformative thing that it's hard to explain. It's the freedom that gives us the freedom to, to, to accept where accept that it's the freedom to give us to, to, to find the, the purpose in our lives the, to, to what some people would say calling following God or picking up your cross. I mean, it's really the, idea of, of saying like you don't have to take your cross but there it is you do with what you want you know, i mean it, it's a, it's a it's a beautiful type of freedom and then uh when you look at this idea that that sin isn't like this management of mistakes you know it's not like this management of like oh i had lust in my heart or oh i whatever i i don't know what even you know the point is is i've, I've luckily i've spent enough time in telling that i don't think of sins in those those categories that i used to but it used to be that constant thing of like smoking and drinking and chewing tobacco and voting democrat you know all these horrible sins um, <laughs> so um you know i was of that generation where the conservatives had already taken over everything in the religious sect um but yes, oh my, you know. So do we still realize that sin does not mean immoral act, that sin should never be used? Um, in the plural, no sins. And not our sin, but rather our sin is the great all-pervading problem of our life. Do we still know that it is arrogant and erroneous? to divide men by calling some sinners and others righteous. Um, as you can see, the you could probably already tell why I like Tillich, is that there's no, there, this, 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 there's a non-binary way of thinking about things here. You, you know, there's the, already the allowance for the contradiction is entered. Because he's saying, you know, the nuances are all here, everybody. He's saying there's no, you know, there's no room for just two categories. We'll continue to talk about it. But he's, I like how he's saying, do we know it's arrogant and erroneous? Like, I really love that he's burning it really hard. Like, it's arrogant and erroneous to divide men by calling some sinners and others righteous. Um, 
For by way of such division, we can usually discover that we ourselves do not quite belong to the sinners, since we have avoided heavy sins, heavy sins, and have made some progress in the control of that this or that sin, and have been even humble enough not to call ourselves righteous. Are we still able to realize that this kind of thinking and feeling about sin is far removed from what the great religious tradition, both within and outside the Bible, has meant when we speak of sin? So he's saying we've completely screwed up this whole idea of what sin is. We've, we, we, we've put it into our to our own ideals. We, we've created sin into the own art to conveniently just be like, you know, to really give power to, in some ways to, 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 to churches to give you a book of, of a new law. We just put a new law in and we go, well, these are the sins and these are the not the sins. And so you don't want to do this and then you come on Sunday and we'll help you not do this and we'll keep you doing the right, we'll keep you righteous. Um, and what's, it's funny because as I was reading this, you know, and it's talking about being accepted and it was talking about grace and everything. Yesterday I saw this pastor put up this thing where he was using the Book of Mormon as a, as a um, door stop. And he was saying, you know, it's not only toilet paper, but it's also a door stop, you know, and saying you should could wipe your ass with it or, you know, do whatever. Just basically saying it's trash. And, and I was really, like, offended by this. Like, I'm not a Mormon. But I was so angry by the lack of respect that this pastor was showing. And I think about, like, his, this, this guy's totally, like, binary thinker. You know, men and women are, have, women are in the kitchen and men are leaders in the church. You know, that kind of thing. And, um, and it was just, but it infuriated me. Like, I was infuriated. I wanted to give up. I wanted to quit the church. I wanted to write a really mean tweet to this guy and tell him where the, you know, stick it where the sun doesn't shine. But then I just started to realize, like, I thought about this talk and I thought about Tillich and then I thought about Dr. King and I thought about, you know, the work of these people and then I thought about things that Jesus would say. And honestly, I was thinking about things Jesus would say just to be like, you're so unlike Jesus. But then in my head, I'm going like, oh, even that is not very Jesus-y, you know? And, um, and, and what I try to do is turn that into gratitude um, because I was grateful that, that I wasn't this type of person. I wasn't scapegoating a whole group of a sect of, of the Christian religion and to say that, you know, I wasn't taking their sacred book, sacred book and disrespecting that. You know, um, when you lose empathy and when you lose sympathy for others, um, when you lose the ability to disagree well, um, it causes separation. And I think what we're going to find out is that this type of thing that uh, Mark Driscoll was doing on his, I don't even like to say the guy's name, but what he was doing on his Twitter was completely, really, in my mind, that's the sin. That's the, that's the, you're disconnecting from people. You're othering people. And uh, we all do it. We all do it. And because um, we usually do it to our enemies and justify it. But, but let's look at this, what this, this has to say. What, what, is, what does Mr. Tillich's talk have to say to us about this? So he says, this kind of thinking and feeling about sin is far removed from what the great religious traditions, both within and outside the Bible, has taught us when we speak of sin. I should like to suggest another word to you. Not as a substitute for the word sin, but as a useful clue in the interpretation of the word sin. He says separation. Separation is an aspect of the experience of everyone. Perhaps the word sin has the same root as to the word asunder. In any case, sin is separation. To be in the state of sin is to be in the state of separation. And separation is threefold. There is separation amongst individuals, which we, uh, lives, which we see every day, which what I was just talking about with this tweet and all this stuff, and, and, and just causing further separation. That's why the Bible says, do not so discord and, and humbly and gently restore people and things like that. And then someone reads Revelation and thinks, you know, oh, literal, Jesus is 
got a sword and blood and a sword coming out of his mouth and, you know, drives a pickup truck and wants to beat ass. You know, I, I don't know how Jesus, like, all of a sudden becomes this other character. It's like the, the pastoral epistles, like, pretending to be Paul. It's just like, it's not, doesn't seem like the same person, the same thing, the same individual. But it says there's three separations amongst individual lives, spiritual uh, separation of man from himself or woman, men, women from themselves, and separation of all from the ground of being. And for Tillich, the ground of being is seen as God. That's how, you know, Tillich felt like the, that God is, it, he called the ground of being. Not some man on the sky, but existence. God, uh, Tillich has a very deep, beautiful understanding of God that's not a Sunday school idea of Jesus or God or what we would think of as, as children. Um, the threefold separation constitutes the state of everything that exists. It is, in, it is a universal fact. It is the fate of every life. And it is our human fate in every special sense. For we as men know that we are separated. We not only suffer with all other creatures because of the self-destruction consequences of our separation, but also know why we suffer. We know that we are estranged from something to which we really belong and with which we should really be united. We know that the fate of separation is not merely a natural event like a flash of sudden lightning, but that it is an experience in which we actively participate in, which our whole personality is involved, and that a fate is also a is also guilt separation which is fate and guilt constitute the mean of the word sin it is this which is the state of our entire existence from its very beginning to its very end such separation is prepared in the mother's womb and before that time in every preceding generation it is manifest in the special actions of our conscious life. It reaches beyond our grave into all the succeeding generations. It is our existence itself. Existence is separation. Before sin is an act in the state. Uh, existence is separation. So if you look at that, what, what Tillich is saying, he, he's also saying like, this is who we are. This is a part of what we are. Uh, maybe that's where all sin all falls short of the glory of God. Um, and for me, I, I've never been like a big OG original sin guy, but when it put into this kind of idea and this type of perspective, I don't struggle with it as much. I go, of course, we're separate. We, you know, how do we, I mean, just like when I would go to, I remember in high school when you just go to lunch and you watch the kids are separated by like race and then by scene and then by this, and, you know, and some kids are anal mingling with each other, but you know, you know, if they decided like, oh, well, we're going to get together you know, in black and white, but it would often be like, oh, well, they're all into hip hop or they're all into skateboarding or they're all into surfer, you know, and everybody was, the separation was already beginning, you know, not meant to mention like the young Democrats and the young Republicans and the young Green Party and the young Yacht Club and all any different groups of meetings. And, but there was already kind of this little separation, people finding who they were and where they fit in and where they didn't. Um, you know, it was there. But existence is separation. Before sin is an act, it is a, it is a state. So it, 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 you know, this is, it's a state that's within us. It's already there before it's an act. It's, it's a state of separation. Think you can, you can all right now come up with someone you're separated from, someone you, you don't like, someone you don't care about. And then I think if you look at yourself, you can look at your own self and see there's areas in your life that you're separate from or things that you want that you don't have or things that you do that you don't want to do, things that you struggle with. Um, and then from the ground of being or from God or things like that, I mean, pff, that's just a no-brainer. Of course there's separation there. I mean, unless you're someone like, you know, Mark Driscoll who has a direct line to God, then I'm sorry, I'm giving him a hard time. I'm, I'm really kind of mad at him. Uh, I'm really mad when, when people 
uh, show such arrogance. And, and honestly, that's one of the reasons we can't, I feel like we can't be a church. Revolution can't call itself a church right now is because it's just like, I don't, I, I, don't even, I wouldn't even see that stuff unless there weren't a few people that I knew who followed the person and somehow Twitter forces me to see stuff because I'm really trying to pull myself out of that thing because I think we have to rethink the way the following of Christianity, the following of Christ, or these, you know, originally was called the way. We have to rethink the way and how it works and how we do it as a community. And uh, the way it is now, it's broken. And, uh, you know, like I, I, I give a really hard time to a lot of my progressive friends when they start acting like conservatives, but then I go back and see some of the conservatives and I forget like how hard they can be as well. But we do have a church here, our group here, a community here, whatever we're gonna call ourselves, a gathering of people who are conservative and people who are who are uh, liberal and progressive and gay and straight and love God and don't believe in God and may even hate God. And we've all come together in this weird little group called Revolution uh, to kind of see if there's another way. What is this other way? And the great thing is, is I think there's people like Paul Tillich, German philosopher, theologian, who helped point us that direction. Um, I think entertainment culture somehow eventually got us off the way or, or we wanted an easy answer. And what I've realized is there's no easy answer. That's why we say argue well here. When you argue well, you, you might be separated by ideas, but you're joined together by a conversation and by an interaction. And uh, it's kind of that's our, our way of saying, you know, like, how do, we get a, how do we be in a state of grace and how do we show a state of grace, not just a state of sin? Uh, let's go. Um, we can say the same thing about grace. For sin and grace are bound to each other. And I really like this idea. I really like that. Uh, you guys, you should study Paul. T I mean, he's amazing. Now, some of you will find it like, I found out like right away, like from people on Facebook that yes, Paul Tillich, uh, had some pornography issues and, and affairs and things like that. So you're going to find out, like, oh, God, yeah, this guy a, was a human being. And uh, luckily I don't, like, it doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> I mean, the guy was a human being. He's dead now. You know, it's, that's, he, he's a great theologian and great philosopher, and his work is important, and that's what's important. Um, I'm not a 1980s evangelical or a new person who's like doing the disc. Like, it's so weird when we discount people and we can't discount them for what we want to discount them for. So we can't be like, you know, like, well, I'm going to tell you a philosopher and a theologian, they, they like dirty magazines. So there, you know, and then why do you, would you say that is because you can't argue with their theology. <laughs> like argue with the theology. Like with my parents, you know, when they went all through this stuff, people would be like, Oh, they're horrible people and they're greedy and and what 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 did my dad get accused of? Well, I mean, he because they were greedy and they were horrible and they had a doghouse with air conditioning. Yeah, but can you tell me exactly what happened? Well, they Jessica Hahn, the church secretary. Well, she actually wasn't the church secretary. Well, pay the lady. Well, I mean, he didn't. Well, uh, you know, like you just you when you can't when you don't know what you're talking about in separation. We often even come up with reasons to separate and we get into gossip and we get into all these other things and we go. Oh, you know, if you want to find out, like, oh, Jay's a messy guy. He doesn't clean his house all the time, you know. So there, you know, I mean, I don't know. I've got other bad things that I'm not going to be confessing to you right now on YouTube without thinking about them first. But the point is, is like we often do these ways of separating each other when we don't have other reasons. Like someone makes a good point, you know. I mean, one of my favorite Bible scholars right now is this guy who 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 is a um, a Mormon, and he's a Bible scholar, and he's genius, and he knows the shit, and he's really great, and he's an intellectual, and he's helped me with a lot of books and recommendations. Um, great guy, um, and, and so, you know, but a lot of people discount him because oh, he's Mormon. And they believe this. And, oh, they believe they got the tablets from this. And I'm like, I think it's really funny when I see people take the piss out of Mormons or even Scientologists or other people, especially when Christians do it. Because it's like, oh, yeah, we believe uh, this woman was a virgin and got pregnant by God and that, you know, God was just like a carpenter for 30-some-odd for years and then just decided, like, oh, it's my time to be God. You know, I'm like, 
and then he floated into the sky. And like, none of us make fun of that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but our ideas are crazy, but they're just heard more. So they're more accepted. So it, it's easy to discount people when they might think differently or maybe believe something differently than you. But what's important often is quality work and not getting distracted by what you think people aren't perfect. Because I'll tell you what, nobody's perfect. We're all crappy. We're all separated. We all have issues. We're all going through stuff. You know? I'm sure we all have, like, weird fetishes and for everything. Food and sex and drink and, you know, whatever. So we can say the same thing about grace. For sin and grace are bound to each other. We do not even have knowledge of sin unless we have already experienced the unity of life, which is grace. Did you hear that? We already ex we do not e even have a knowledge of sin unless we have already experienced the unity of life, which is grace. So it's saying like we don't even realize what it is until we get a grace. Now this is interesting that we understand grace. This gets really, really interesting. And conversely, we could not grasp the meaning of grace without having experienced the separation of life, which is sin. Grace is just as difficult to describe as sin. Yeah, I'm going to say that. Because um, grace is going to call us to be unified in some ways, and it, it's hard to understand that as well. For some people, grace is the willingness of a divine king and a father to forgive over and over again for the foolishness and weakness of his subjects and his children. Did you hear that? For some people, the idea of grace is like a king, basically saying, you are forgiven, grace to you. Oh, you've done it again, you foolish child, grace to you. You know, that, that's the idea. But what does Tillich say about this? He goes, we must, re we, must, we must reject such a concept of grace. So already, I think if you can understand that like this, this idea that sin is separation, I think we can start thinking, well, then maybe grace has something to do with reconciliation and restoration. Hey, so you're here today. Awesome. Um, they're supposed to be watching Canadians fight on ice. Um, we must reject such a concept of grace. Now, I'll be honest with you. To me, this is what grace was for a long time. Even in the beginning, I thought, you know, grace had this simple idea. But why am I still speaking about grace like 27 years? Oh, gosh, longer than that. Like 20, 28 years since I, I, I first, I guess 27 years. I'm 47. What is, you know, why am I still talking about it? Is because it has evolved over time. My understanding has evolved over time, and it just continues to get deeper the more I grasp grace and the more I struggle with it. Um... So we must reject the concept of the king being like, I forgive you, foolish people. You know, that he's, this is the grace, concept of grace we've got to reject. Now you're going like, some, I, I bet you some of you are going like, this is my whole concept of grace. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> now it's gone. <laughs> For it is merely childish destruction of human dignity. Um... For others, grace is a magic power in the dark place of the soul, but a power without any significance for particular, for pr practical life, a quickly vanishing and useless idea. Did you hear that? For others, grace is a magic power in the dark places of the soul, but a power without any significance for practical life, a quick vanishing and useless idea. That was another concept I probably struggled with for a while as well, kind of probably before I really understood grace. What it, what, it just seemed like this, oh, amazing grace. It's this like weird cloud that doesn't really do anything, but it's nice. Um, for others, grace is the benevolence that we must find besides the cruelty and destruction in life. But then it does not matter whether we say life goes on or whether we say there is grace in life. If grace means no more than this, the world should and will disappear. For other people, grace indicates the gifts that one has received from the nature of society and the power to do good things with the help of those gifts. But grace is more than a gift. And grace, something is overcome. Grace incurs, now listen to this, this is very important. This is where I want you guys to listen. Great. This is Tillich. 
you are accepted sermon. <laughs> Grace occurs in spite of something. Grace occurs in spite of separation and in strange estrangement. Now that makes me excited to hear. Grace, the reunion of life with life, the reconciliation of self with self. Grace is the acceptance of that which is rejected. Grace transforms fate into a meaningful destiny. I like that, you know, fate or destiny, you know, <laughs> turns fate into destiny. It changes guilt into confidence and courage. There is something triumphant in the word grace. In spite of the aboundings of sin, grace abounds much more. But I love this is, is it, it occurs in, in spite of separation and estrangement. And this is why we talk about grace. This is why we talk about arguing well. This is why we talk about coming together, you know, um, disagreeing well. Why we should have not just a diversity of like, oh, we're a rainbow, but we should have a diversity of thoughts, you know, why, you know, we shouldn't allow politicians to dictate that with who we're friends with. We shouldn't allow religions to dictate who we're friends with. I was just reading another thing. Like, here I am mad at Driscoll for giving a hard time to, uh, to to my Mormon brothers and sisters. And then I saw another Mormon thing where, you know, they I have a wedding. I don't know what their wedding's called, the ceiling or something, or something like that. And uh, uh, The ceiling. I think it's probably ceiling, not ceiling, not ceiling. But I, I could be right or wrong. I don't know. But I guess, like, if you're not Mormon, you can't go. And it was saying families felt rejected. So I was talking to this woman. I'm like, I'm so sorry that you're feeling rejected. And I was surprised how many people were like, well, if you don't accept the teachings and you can't come, and that's just tough titty. And I'm going like, like, separation. It's all separation. Like, the church has been so focused on separation of us and them that, that you would, if Tillich is correct, the church is one of the greatest uh, perpetrators of sin in the world. You hear what I'm saying? Like, it, 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 you know, and like denominations are just basically a bed of sin, den of sin. Because it's separation. Unless we can use grace to allow those separations to not be there. And learn, we can learn to disagree well and not be afraid of other people's ideas. You know? I would love to see a place where Christians who maybe even think like, well, I don't know, the LGBTQ thing might be a sin, and the LGBTQ people could sit down and they could have a conversation and at least share some humanity and at least cause each other to think something and see things differently. I'm not, you know, obviously I'm on the LGBTQ, like, equality issues. It's not a sin issue, but I'm just saying these people should be able to come together and have conversations. The most fruit I've ever seen from, from that type of work was working with Soul Force where we actually went and sat down and met with leaders and seeing those churches change over months and years and time but it came a lot of that came from having personal conversations you know and people say well I don't want to be sit down with people who don't recognize me or see me as human but these folks who are with me and I was with they, they, they didn't mind that these people didn't recognize them as humans or saw them as sinners or saw them less than and they sat down and they had these conversations and they said you might want separation, but we're here because we don't want any more separation. So if this is the right, and this is true, then we've got some big issues here, folks. There's some big issues. Oh, nice. Um, I love that. So grace is the acceptance of that which is rejected. All right, we'll jump down to the next part here. And now let us look down onto ourselves to discover there is this struggle between separation and reunion, between sin and grace, and the relation to others in our relation to ourselves, and then in our relation to the ground and aim of our being. If our souls respond to the description that I intend to give, words like sin and separation, grace and reunion, may have a new meaning for us. But the words themselves are not important. It is the response of the deepest levels of our being that is important. And I love that because these words do give me like this, do something inside me that just gives me hope. It is such a response where to occur among us this moment, we could say that we have known grace. Who has not at some time been lonely in the midst of a social event. 
the feeling of our separation from the rest of life is the most accurate when we are surrounded by and in the noise of talk, of others' talk. We realize then, much more than in the moment of solitude, how strange we are to each other. How estranged life is from life. Each one of us draws back into themselves. We cannot penetrate the hidden center of another individual, nor can that individual pass beyond the shroud that covers our own being. Even the greatest love cannot break through the walls of the self. Who has not experienced that disillusionment at all great, of all great love? If one were to hurl away his self in complete self-surrender, he would become a nothing without a form or strength, a self without a self, merely an object of contempt and abuse. Um, and just to kind of look at the idea here is what he's saying is um, the separation is felt in a crowd, even if it's a crowd that you're with, even if it's a crowd you love. I mean, I think about going to shows bands and we all have this this thing in front of us in common or even when I used to go to church I always felt this loneliness I always felt this separation and I've always had to work extra hard to connect with people and 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 when I'm in a community really push myself to be in community to be in friendships and to have relationships right now I'm not doing great in that aspect of my life um, because it's something that it requires a lot of work for me um, and it's funny because I was reading this and I was like, oh God, yeah. I mean, I sit at home by myself and eat my dinner and feel fine. I go out into a crowd and I feel like, you know, oh, I'm so lonely. So a lot of this makes complete sense just on a, just a personal level for myself. Um, you extroverts might feel a little bit different about that, but, um, let's see what Tillich has to say about that. Our generation knows more than the generation of our fathers. Now remember, he's speaking this in like 1948. Of our fathers about the hidden hostility in the ground of our, of our souls. Today we know much about the profusive aggressiveness in, the, in every being. Today we confirm what Immanuel Kant, the prophet of human reason and dignity, was honest enough to say. There is something in the misfortune of our best friends which does not displease us. Did you hear that? There's something in the misfortune of our best friends that do not displease us. I'm sure the past 10 years of my life have, have pleased a lot of my friends. Um, who, amount us to dis who among us is dishonest enough to deny that, th that this is true also of him? Are we not almost always ready to abuse everybody and everything, although often in a very refined way? Of course. I mean, if I'm going to abuse you, it's going to be refined. Um, in a refined way, for the pleasure of self eva eva uh, eleva elevation. So he's saying for the pressure of lifting oneself up. For an occasion for boasting, for a moment of lust, to know that we are ready is to know that the meaning of the separation of life from life and sin abounding. And it's funny because everybody's like, I don't know about that. But like, I mean, even like when I worked at a record store, I was like trying to be like, oh yeah, have you guys heard of like Devil Clutch? I mean, oh, you know, trying to always like give some crazy band and, you know, out band somebody. Oh, I saw them and, oh, you like them? Oh yeah, I saw them in 82 when they were called, uh, you know, Devil Drive, you know. <laughs> Whatever, you know, I mean, it was always this, or, or we, you know, and the last thing is a good thing is, you know, building yourself up, you know, not helping your friends promote, you know, self-promotion. I mean, that's my own struggles, but there's other things like that, you know, um, that Tillich's talking about here. Um, the most irrevocable expression of separation of life from life today is the attitude of social groups within nations towards each other and the attitude of nations themselves towards other nations. Now, this is in the 40s, remember. 
The walls of distance and time and space have been removed by technical progress. They had the telephone and I don't know, they didn't have emails yet, but they had the post office. Um, the walls and distance and time and space have been removed by technical progress, but the walls of estrangement between hearts and heart, between heart and heart have been incredibly strengthened. And that's so true. You think about the more technology we have, the more way we have to connect to each other, that's ways that are not necessarily in person, the more separate we become. And here he's talking about nations. But, you know, now it is this nation. It's like right and left, boom, separate, you know. And, uh, and then we've got the subsets of every group, you know, who some are a little bit farther left, some are a little bit farther right, and, you know, some of them middle, and some are, you know, but, you know, this group and this group and this group and this group and this group, and it's separation, separation, separation. And, <clears throat> I mean, you know, I would say that the revolution is a reunion group. We are about reunion, you know, a revolution of reunion, a revolution of, of restoration, a revolution of grace, of bringing, it, it is fighting this concept of what Tillich's talking about as sin, is this separation. And that we can do it in a way where we don't all have to subscribe to the same thing, or we don't have to force each other to sign up for this special club we want to be in. Excuse my language. Um, I'm just a bit passionate about this stuff. So the walls of estrangement go up, the more we're able to communicate with each other. And it's like being in the crowded room. So what, who will save us from this horrible thing? Oh, I lost two people with my, my bad language. Um, the madness of the German Nazis and the cruelty of the lynching mobs of the South provide too easy an excuse for us to turn our thoughts from our own selves. Now, this is going to get deep, and this is going to hit us all hard, so buckle up, okay, folks, for this one. Um, the lynch mobs of the South ride too an easy excuse for us to turn our thoughts from our own selves. But we let our, let's just consider ourselves and what we feel when we read the morning and tonight. He's talking about the papers. That in some sections of uh, Europe, in, of Europe, all the children under the age of three are sick and dying, or that in some sections of Asia, this obviously doesn't happen in the 40s, millions without homes are freezing and starving to death, or the strangeness of life to life is evident to the strange fact that we can know all this. We can know all the suffering in the world. We can know about these earthquakes. We can know about wars in Ukraine. We can know about people starving all over the place. And we're still really worried about, like, if Nike supports our cause or if uh, Lululemon is uh, anti-racist. You know, those are important. <laughs> um, the, the, the strangeness of life and the evidence of straight fact that we can know all this and yet can live today and this morning tonight as though we were completely ignorant. So we can live life and act like none of this is happening, like there's not suffering in the world. And, oh, and we're going to argue about our own things. I mean, like the ironic thing is that anybody who claims themselves to be so progressive and so social justice orientated and is using an Apple product or wearing a Nike product, and I have a Converse on, which is a product of Nike, and I'm talking to you on an Apple phone, you know, and, and the suffering of the, that causes of people. And then people will defend it on the other side and things like that. But the Apple phone is a little bit harder to, to argue with. Um, the children miners and things like that, or the chocolate we buy, or the diamonds that we get, or the bananas, and where do the bananas come? You know, I mean, it's like there, there's constantly things of like we're causing other people to suffering, but we just go, oh, no, the bad people are uh, the guys in Florida. Those are the bad people, not me. You know, I'm against slavery. I mean, unless it's for this technological wonder before us <laughs> that I'm able to talk to and find out anything in the world and talk to my friends on Twitter and Facebook, and, and you know, which are also owned by billionaires who aren't doing a whole lot of great for the world, but we're going to support them. And they also cause us to care about our, our political leaders more, which divide us even more, you know. And, um, I mean, I remember the last race, because I liked Bernie Sanders, I had people calling me a Bernie bro, and I'm like, it doesn't make anything, like, it doesn't really make sense as a burn to take like someone who's a socialist and then put bro with it because bro is just like, oh, you're a bro, bro. And I'm like, but socialism really isn't a bro-y thing. But anyway, the 
that's the thing. Is it just more ways to divide? Or, okay, boomer. You know, things like that. There's just more ways to cut and divide. Like, maybe first started as funny, but then become like a slur. You know, there's, there's constantly, how do we separate each other? You know? And so the whole world is suffering, and, and America doesn't give a damn. You know, we don't give a damn. We only give a damn of what's happening within our, you know, borders of water, which is really insane. All right, sorry. I'll get off my soapbox here for a second and finish this. Um, oh, one more minute, Milo. Yeah, sorry, guys. Milo just reminded me that I've got an hour. Sorry, guys. So, well, in this, I'm almost we're very close to being done with for the day. Um, thanks for sticking with me. You have stuck with me. Um, and I refer to the most sensitive people among us. So he's saying, like, the strange fact is, the strange fact is that we can know all this, and yet we can live today, the morning, tonight, as though they were completely ignore, ignorant. And I refer to this most sensitive, and I'm referring to the most sensitive people amongst us, among us, which I'm a very sensitive person, and he's right. In both mankind and nature, life is separated from life. Estrangement prevails among all things that live. Sin abounds. So if you go like, well, I don't know if all sin all fall short, or maybe we weren't born into sin, because I've never been an original sin guy, but the more I read this, the more I might think, like, well, maybe in this idea I do agree with it. Um, it's just estrangement. But then the idea that if you look at Christ and you look at Calvary and all that stuff, it's supposed to be a unifier, not a separator. But unfortunately, religion and Christianity acts more of a separator than it does a connector. You know? And then people leave the religion. Listen to this. Then people leave Christianity. And what do they do? They're angry at Christianity, so they separate themselves even more and start thinking, say, well, screw those guys. and screw anybody who believes that. And not only my church, but every church. And then the separation, and it continues. It just continues playing out over and over. Same story, over and over again. And then in 10 years, they rededicate their life to Jesus and then become even more conservative. And then they leave again and become even more crazy. But it's still separation, pushing people away, pushing each other away. Yeah, and, and someone said, thank you. We learned so much from you. I appreciate it. I mean, this is a book, I, you know, thank goodness for Paul Tillich. Uh, trying to update his talk, you know, with the nerve of me. Um, I also just bought a really great Greek, Greek, Greek language lexicon that just cost, cost $180. So, uh, you know, but I'm really trying my best to, like, learn and study because I want this community to, I want to be here. I want to be a speaker. I want to add something to your life. All right, almost done. It is important to remember that we are not merely separated from each other. For we are also separated from ourselves. Man against himself. It is not merely the title of a book, but rather also indicates the rediscovery of the age-old insight. Man is split within himself. This is very true. It's, 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 psychology tells us this. Life moves against itself through aggression, hate, and despair. We are to condemn. We, won't, we are won't want to condemn self-love. We want to self, you know. But what we really mean to condemn is contrary to self-love. It is in a mixture of selfishness and self-hate that permanently pursue us, that prevent us from loving others, and that prohibit us from losing ourselves in the love with which we are loved eternally. We who is able to love, uh, he, sorry, he who is able to love himself is able to love others also. He who has learned to overcome self-contempt has overcome his contempt for others. I, and I really believe this, truly. But the depth of our separation lies in just the fact that we are not capable of, of a great and merciful divine love towards ourselves. On the contrary, in each of us, there is an instinct of self-destruction which is strong as our instinct of self-preservation. And our tendency to abuse and destroy others, there is an open or hidden tendency to abuse and destroy ourselves. Cruelty, and I'm going to end with this quote, and we'll start again next week. And this is a famous quote of his, which is from the sermon. Cruelty towards others is always cruelty towards ourselves. 
Cruelty towards others is always cruelty towards ourselves. Um, could you imagine the perspective we would have if we really focused on all the suffering in the world? I mean, I guess it's, it, it's grateful that a lot of us are able to sleep at night and, and not see these things because we would lose our mind, right? Like if I had to go to bed every night thinking about the phone that I was looking at and like kids with no shoes climbing into mines, grabbing like chemicals and rocks and things so I could have this phone, I don't think I'd be able to sleep very well. I already don't sleep well because of this damn thing. Ugh. Anyway, so I think we've covered the sin part, the separation part. And um, next week's next week's the rest of, of Tillich's talk, and it's really great. Um, I'm going to act like a youth pastor and be like, invite a friend. Invite a friend, and they can listen to this this Wednesday, or they can watch it now. We just record it. It goes up right now. They can watch this. And then they can come next Sunday and listen to this about grace. If you have somebody in mind, maybe someone you're separate from, or someone who's doing some separating, or someone who's maybe doing some restoration, <laughs> everybody is welcome. Um, and we can talk more about this, because I think this is an important talk, an important, so much so that I want to hire like a voice person to read this, and we'll post it up so people can just listen to the sermon all the way through without my crazy interflections and re reflections of this master, you know. I'm sure he really hoped that one day a high school GED graduate would come and comment on his work. Um, some dreams do come true, Paul. You're welcome. All right, folks, listen, thanks for sticking with me for so long. If you like this work, you like what we're done, we really could use your support. Revolutionchurch.com, tax-deductible donation um, is there if, if you want a little tax deductible thing uh, on the, we, we, we've got that available to you we really could use your support it's how I do this, it's how I get my books it's how I read, it's my studies and, and, and everything we do um, and uh, how we come together and, and, and we've been going on 30 years and hopefully we'll go on, I don't know about 30 years more, but maybe 10, 20 <laughs> let's see what happens um, but I think this talk is important and I think it's one of those talks that's going to help us bring us in to a new movement and a new reformation within to the church. Um, but yeah, support. You can also retweet by retweeting this stuff, by getting the links and sharing the links. You can share the YouTube link, the Twitter link, the Facebook link. The, 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 uh, the podcast is on Apple. It's on Spotify. It's on all these different groups. We'll find out about a new uh, podcast site and, and realize we're not on it. Josh is like, oh, we're doing boom, and then all of a sudden we're on it. So you can tell us where you want us. If you're not hearing us somewhere, tell us where we should be, and we'll try to get there. Um, that's what we're trying to get out there. But, um, so, but, but helping share this stuff is great um, and, and letting people know about it. Um, I, I think Twitter is kind of fruitless at this point because I don't, it doesn't seem like a whole lot of people, there's one or two people who share, and I really appreciate that. But um, all right, folks, so next week, you are accepted, part two, Electric Boogaloo. Have a good week. Blessings. I'm going to go um, wall climbing with my children. Oh, I'm going to watch them wall climb. Bye. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website.